Well, uh, and uh, we praise the Lord for everything. Welcome wherever you are tuned in and uh, Happy New Year, Happy 2024. The Lord has been able to enable us to see another year and uh, I know that uh, he has some good plans for us. And uh, as we go throughout the year, we pray that if God gives us a chance and a life that uh, we may represent him and uh, we may be his ambassadors in this world that is full of iniquity and is trouble. But uh, welcome to this year. And uh, I thought that uh, at the beginning of this year, as I'll be going through various series of studies, uh, different presentations, I thought that uh, I'll just start somewhere and talk uh, a little bit about uh, the Day of Atonement. And so I welcome all of us in this presentation, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment, which is good news to Christians. And so before I talk uh, a lot, I'll welcome us for a word of prayer before we continue. Heavenly Father, we need your presence and uh, we need your guidance. We just need uh, perfect weather and perfect internet, Lord, that uh, everyone may be benefited with this message. And so I do pray that uh, as we represent you, that uh, you will speak through me and you'll speak to all of us in this year, that, Lord, we may grow closer to thee. Bless your children. It's in Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um. The Day of Atonement is something that uh, really uh, is something that was in the Hebrew sanctuary and uh, it was the fourth, uh, or uh, we may say, uh, it was a very important uh, time in the Hebrew calendar. It was a, a very important time in the Hebrew calendar where the children of uh, Israel had to meet before the Lord and uh, assemble before the sanctuary for their sins to be blotted out of uh, of uh, the, the sanctuary. Uh, in the sanctuary, we had the feast of uh, the Passover, the unleavened bread. Then we had uh, the... The, the feast of first fruits and then now uh, we had the blowing of the trumpets we had uh, the day of atonement and then uh, we had the feast of the tabernacles uh, i'm sorry we had the, uh, uh, the, the the passover we had the unleavened bread we had uh, the first fruits and then we have the the feasts uh the feast of weeks the feast of weeks then the fifth one was the the, the 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 trumpets. Then we had the sixth one was um, the day of atonement, and the seventh one was the feast of uh, the tabernacles. Um, it was coupled between the feast of trumpets. This is the day of atonement was coupled uh, between the feast of trumpets and the feast of tabernacles, and uh, these three feasts made up the what we call the fall feast or the autumn feast in the Jewish uh, religious year. The first of the three autumn feasts was the Feast of the Trumpets, and it fell on the seventh month of the first day of the month. And uh, you can find that in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 to 25, where actually we are told, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no survival work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And so uh, when you look at uh, the feast uh, of the trumpet, this is uh, uh, something that uh, we can look in. Uh, the feast of the trumpet was uh, the sound of an alarm. So it's like a, a sound of an alarm. The first two, the feast took place 10 days before the Day of Atonement. The Jewish people call this feast Rosh Hash Hashanah, which literally means the head of the year, and it is observed as the start of the civil year in contrast, 
contrast with the religious year which starts with the Passover on the Jewish calendar. The Feast of Trumpets is so important in Jewish thinking that it stands alongside Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement to comprise what Judaism calls uh, the High Holy Days on the Jewish religious calendar. It begins the 10 days of awe before the Days of Atonement. Before the Day of Atonement, it was a warning blast to prepare for the Day of Atonement. And so before the Day of Atonement began, the children of Israel had to have the Feast of Trumpets to uh, prepare them. They had to have a Feast of the Trumpets uh, to prepare them for the coming events. Uh, the, the trumpet to uh, here in the Feast of the Trumpet was uh, the shofar, a ram's horn. It was a distinctive from the silver trumpets blown on the other new moon. Silver trumpets were sounded at the daily band offering at, at the beginning of each new month. You can get that in Numbers chapter 10, verses 10. But the shofar specifically was blown on the beginning of the month's tishri. It had a special sound to get ready for the day of atonement. And so the Feast of Trumpets was 10 days before the Day of Atonement. And due to the fact that the, this feast had end-time ramifications, like all the other feasts, this corresponds with um, the warnings because it was an alarm. It was a warning prior to the day of judgment or the day of blotting out the, um, uh, the transgression of the people of God. And you can understand that this was in fulfillment with the... Um, the warnings in the book of Matthew chapter 24, the signs of the time, and then corresponding to the midnight cry and uh, William Miller and those who are heralding the coming of the Lord. And so it was in 1830s, precisely 1833, when um, uh, William Miller got a license to preach about the second advent. And so that 10 days as Advent is to be translated to 10 years of warning before the Day of Atonement. Now, who, who, who was William Miller? Just uh, to back up something, who was uh, uh, William Miller, by the way? An upright, honest-hearted farmer. This is uh, the description we get uh, in uh, uh, Great Controversy, page uh, 317. Uh, we are told that... Uh, We are told that uh, an upright, honest-hearted farmer who had been led to doubt the divine authority of the scriptures, yet who sincerely desired to know the truth, was the man especially chosen of God to lead out in the proclamation of Christ's second coming. Like many other reformers, William Miller had in early life battled with poverty and had thus learned the great lessons of energy and self-denial. And so... Uh, it was this weak vessel that was chosen to be able to herald or to sound the feast of the trumpet alongside the signs of the time uh, to herald the, the Day of Atonement, which we understand started in 1844. When you read in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 26 to 32, we are told, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this, this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. And he shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For to save a soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And to save a soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. He shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Leviticus 23, 26 to 32. Now, um, about this Yom Kippur, uh, this is... Uh, what also we, we learned that uh, Yom Kippur, also known as the Day of Atonement, Day of Art One Men, is the holiest day of the year for religious Jews. It is central themes are atonement and repentance. According to the Jewish tradition, God inscribes each person's fate for the coming year into a book, the Book of Life, on Rosh Hashanah, and waits until Yom Kippur to seal the verdict. And so... Um, 
during the days of war a Jew uh, uh, during the days of war a Jew tries to amend his or her behavior and seek forgiveness for wrongs done against God and against other human beings and um, uh, we, we have to remember one thing that uh, even uh, even though God was judging his people and blotting out the sins of the people, he, he, he never just stopped at those, the breaking of the law or the doing of the law, but um, every motive was looked into um, and uh, every intent of the actions of the people, uh, then the judgment uh, was able to be passed. And so uh, in Leviticus 23, Verses 29 uh, and 30, we are, we are told that for to save a soul, it be a for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, the day of atonement, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among the people. And today, the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are days of repentance when Jews express remorse for their sins through the prayer and fasting. Yom Kippur is the final day of judgment when each person's fate is sealed by God for upcoming year. And um, talking about this issue of um, confessing sin and uh, being at um, um, what we may call at father's business and not doing any survival work. We are told in the book uh, Christian Service and uh, I'd just like to highlight one thing before we continue uh, on the issue of uh, being at uh, being uh, be assembling uh, around the sanctuary or the tabernacle and uh, not doing any work. Uh, in, in this day, uh, we may call it a job reformation. In this day, we may call it uh, a job uh, re reformation. And uh, I just like you to look uh, at this and see how important this issue is of afflicting our souls and being gathered around um, the sanctuary. In the book, uh, Christian Service, page 108, paragraph 3, uh, we read that many have the idea that if their life is uh, a working business life, they can do nothing for the salvation of souls, nothing to advance the cause of their Redeemer. They say they cannot do things by the halves and therefore turn from religious duties and religious exercises and uh, bury themselves up in the world. They make their business primary and forget God, and he is displeased with them. If any are engaged in business where they cannot advance in their divine life and perfect holiness in the fear of God, they should change to a business in which they can have Jesus with them every hour. And so these were the great issues in the day of atonement because every hour they had to have uh, a God with them. They had to be assembled uh, before the sanctuary. They had uh, to be confessing their sins and afflicting their souls. And so they did not have to be participating in common work. And so um, it, it, it was uh, in paramount that um, they be where they could perfect their character. And today also, as we are living in the antitypical day of atonement, we should be really at a place where every hour we are with Jesus Christ, be it in our common job, uh, we should be sure that we are with Jesus. If that is not the case, then uh, we should be able to reform the jobs that we are, uh, are doing. What was the uniqueness of this day? Let us look at the uniqueness of this day then. In that day, the only day the high priest went into the most holy place, the only day the high priest only wore his linen clothes instead of his daily attire regalia. And um, uh, also the only that mediation was for cleansing and not for forgiveness, by the way, blotting out of the sin. The only day that sin was removed and not placed in the uh, sanctuary. That is how unique uh, this day was, the day of uh, atonement. Um. Why then a day of atonement, by the way? In the daily service, as you remember, a person received forgiveness for their sins. There was sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. And we shall see how this actually is a, a bad thing in, in the day of atonement. And even in, in other days, we see that uh, sinning and repenting and sinning and repenting, that is why, that is not what God intended, that uh, 
the children of Israel may be sinning and repenting and multiply the sacrifices. No. In the daily service, their sin was transferred to the sanctuary. They were forgiven. God's entire government is built on this fact. When anyone comes to God through the merits of Christ and asks for forgiveness, God's character of justice must forgive. Why was it necessary for a day of atonement then? Why was it necessary for a future day of atonement judgment if a person had already been forgiven? The answer to this unlocks one of the most beautiful aspects of the entire salvation process or uh, the plan of redemption. But um, let us uh, back up this issue of uh, sinning and repenting. Is, is it something that uh, God had uh, intended that should continue in Israel, even though it was a daily service? Uh, in uh, in uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume uh, 4, page 400, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, page 534, Paragraph one, look at this. Did God intend that people be sinning and repenting even in the daily? And if that is not what he intended in the daily, how much more in the day of atonement when our sins should be blotted out of the sanctuary? Do we have a time of sinning and repenting, sinning and um, repenting? Uh, I'd like to point you to these uh, beautiful words in uh, 45, um, 34.4. We are told communion with God imparts to the soul an intimate knowledge of his will. But many who profess the faith know not what true conversion is. They have no experience in communion with the Father through Jesus Christ and have never felt the power of divine grace to sanctify the heart. Praying and sinning, sinning and praying, their lives are full of malice, deceit, envy, jealousy, and self-love. The prayers of this class are an abomination to God. True prayer engages the energies of the soul and affects the life. He who thus pours out his wants before God feels the emptiness of everything else under heaven. All my desire is before thee, said David, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul uh, in me. And then... Uh, uh, you found that this is not what God intended, that uh, uh, we should not be sinning and repenting, but overcoming. And um, in this in this day of atonement, what are we to learn? Uh, what is also God intending for us? In uh, 3T, 3, in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3, page 474, paragraph uh, one, this is what um, uh, we get. It is not time for lightness, vanity, or crippling. The sins of this earth history are soon to close. Minds that have been left to lose thought need change, says the Apostle Peter. Guard up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Again, we read that, um, my brethren, we are living in the most solemn period of this earth history. There is never time to sin. It is always perilous, continuing transgression, but in a special sense, is this true at the present time? We are now upon the very borders of eternal world and stand in a more solemn relation to time and to eternity than ever before. Now let every person search his own heart and plead for the bright beams of the sun of righteousness to expel all spiritual darkness and cleanse from defilement. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin, us our sins, and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Through faith, irrespective of feeling, Jesus, the author of our salvation, the finish of our faith, will, by his precious grace, strengthen the moral powers, and the sinner may reckon himself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Simple faith, with the love of Christ in the soul, unites the believer to God. While toiling in battle as faithful soldier of Christ, he has the sympathy of the whole loyal universe. The ministering angels are around about him to aid in the conflict so that he may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my strength and my shield. I shall not be overcome. 
by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 147, paragraph 1. Also, this is again what we see um, that uh, this is no time to leave sinning. Uh, in uh, Adventist Home, page uh, 549, paragraph 3. We are living in the most solemn period of this earth history. There is never time to sin. It is always perilous to continue in transgression, but in a special sense in this true at the present time. And so it repeats what uh, we have already read. And so this day of atonement is a very special day because it was not just a time of, of um, sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting, but it was a blotting out of the sin so that the sins may not come to the sanctuary again, but they may be blotted out. One thing that we have to note is the children of Israel was to be saved uh, from their sins and from the presence of sin. And that is what God is doing on this day of atonement. And so uh, on this day, uh, we are told that uh, God is ready to do for his children what they can do for himself. That God is ready to do for his children uh, what they can do for himself. And uh, th this is where we get the message of uh, righteousness by faith. Uh, where, you know, the, the main purpose of God is... Uh, to lay the glory of man in dust and then do for him what he can do, not do for himself. He is standing before us that he may we may be pointed to his son and to his divine image. He who is ready to dispense with the gifts that he may gift us. And so it is the putting off of the old man and putting on of the new man forever never to be defiled again in fact um, as i say it is uh, the third angel's message in uh, uh, verity uh, that is uh, the day of atonement goes hand in hand with the cleansing of the temple and the restoration of uh, the temple or the sanctuary uh, this is um, uh, the just shall live by faith because the cleansing of the temple is the cleansing the soul of uh, sin in um in tm 91 and 92 TM 91 and 92, the message of justification by faith. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elder Swagon and Jonas. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense with rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message which is to be given, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the spirit in large measure. Now, uh, when you read uh, 92, the uplifted savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the lamb slain sitting upon the throne to dispense the priceless covenant blessings, the benefits he died to purchase for every soul who should believe on him. John will not express that love in words. It was too deep, too broad. He calls upon the human family to behold it. Christ is pleading for the church in the heavenly courts above, pleading for those whom he paid the redemption price of his own life blood. Centuries, ages can never diminish the efficacy of his, this atoning sacrifice. The message of the gospel of his grace was to be given to the church in clear and distinct lines that the world should no longer say that Seventh-day Adventists talk the law, the law, but do not teach or believe Christ. And so uh, you find that uh, in the day of atonement, in the cleansing of the sanctuary, uh, people needed to be pointed to their high 
priest. People needed to be pointed to the high priest. And so, uh, why to the high priest? So that he may dispense with the blessings from the most holy place, which is in the presence of the Father. Now, throughout the Jewish year, a person could come to the temple, confess his sins, take the life of the animal, and then the priest would mediate the blood in the temple, thus transferring the sin uh, through the blood to the sanctuary. Throughout the year, sin remained in the sanctuary, but is God the one responsible for sin? The Day of Atonement then gives us the answer that um, uh, sin was taken back to the originator, even though Christ would bear it for that season that his people came unto the sanctuary, uh, uh, at last sin was to return to the rightful owner. Th that one we can read in, um, uh, we can read in the book of Psalms, Psalms 7.16. In the book of Psalms, um, that is Psalm 7.16, we read that his mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own peril. So in the daily, you find that sin went to the veil, which represented Jesus Christ according to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. But then in the day of atonement, Christ who is able to conquer the devil had to transfer that sin to the rightful honor. And that is why it is also represented in the book of um, Leviticus. Uh, the book of Leviticus chapter 16. And uh, we see from uh, verses 20 and 21. Let us read uh, Leviticus chapter 16 verses 20 and 21 what was the meaning of the day of atonement and when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar shall bring the life god so when the reconciliation comes to an end and the sins of the people are cleansed are forgiven and are uh, pardon written upon their names after this process is over verse 21 the high priest, which is Aaron, and which will be Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live God, which was uh, Azazel, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. Confessing means just uh, uh, acknowledging that this is what they had done, and who made them do that is this and this. And confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions in all their sins putting them upon the head of the God Azazel and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. This was the most solemn part of the day of atonement when sin shall be transferred to it is some um, uh, rightful uh, honor. And so it was logical that um, whoever was the instigator and those who refused to participate in this grand event will be left to their own choices. Uh, God does not force anyone. Uh, uh, God does not force anyone to, 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 to really be on his side. And so people are given the whole year to make choices. We have been given all these years we have been in this earth to make a choice. And uh, after making a choice, then what next? We have to abide by our choice. God has to honor our choice. He doesn't force anyone into it. And so the day of atonement was also a day of uh, allowing everyone to have their own choice. And so while the day of atonement for God's people will conclude at the close of probation, because the sin problem has been dealt with in, the lives, in their lives, Atonement ultimately will not be complete until the millennium when the devil, his angels, and his followers are destroyed. Then the sin problem will be totally dealt with. And what do you imagine against the Lord? In Nahum 1 9, we are told he will make at an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. That is Nahum 1 9. And so, uh, lastly, after being in heaven and investigating the records according to 1 
uh, First Corinthians chapter 6, I presume so, and everyone making their choices, it will be a time to reward everyone according to their work. And so those who have not participated in the Day of Atonement, then uh, they'll be given to what uh, they deserve or what uh, 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 what, uh, what has been uh, their work. And so what is Christ actually doing right now? Christ is preparing a people. And as it's illustrated in the, in the parable of the wedding, he has procured a wedding garment for everyone. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 11, uh, we read that, and when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man which had not a wedding garment, even though the wedding garment had been provided. This man decided that he will not put on his garment, but he will appear as he wishes. But remember, this wedding was the wedding of the king. It was not the wedding of this man. And the king has a right to say how people will appear in their wedding. If I say today I'm having a wedding, I have a say. Uh, if uh, it is uh, a private property, I have a say who shall come in. Not everyone can come in there to do what they will want. In order for me to know these are my guests, I like them to uh, array themselves in a certain attire. And so the king here in Matthew chapter 22 really has a wedding and uh, he gives uh, instruction on how people should appear there. And one person comes there and he said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Why was he speechless? Because the instructions were there, but he could not heed unto them. He thought that because he called himself a friend and this king could see himself as a friend to this person because God is not an enemy for everyone. He could just come as he wished. Like uh, Cain presented himself before God the way he wanted, not as the Lord himself has told him to appear before him. And so he was speechless. Then the king say, the, then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And so let us be careful that uh, we will not call ourselves Christians on our own terms, but on the terms that God has prescribed. E. G. White commenting on this on, in Christ Object Lesson, page 310, we are told that uh, she says that the wedding garment in the parable is represented with pure, spotless character with which Christ's true followers will possess. To the church, it is given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such a thing, according to Ephesians 5.27. The fine linen says the scripture is the righteousness of the saints in Revelation 19.8. It is the righteousness of Christ, his own unblemished character that through faith is imparted to all who receive him as their personal uh, uh, savior. And uh, when uh, you look in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, it says that I'll rejoice in the Lord because he has adorned me with the garments of salvation. It is Christ only who gives the garment of salvation. And this loom of heaven uh, has no thread of human devising. It is by faith. It is by the prescription of Jesus Christ that we can enter those heavenly guests. And so uh, on the day of atonement, again, you had to appear as uh, uh, God had prescribed. And so uh, the plan of redemption really hung upon uh the day of atonement and uh, in leviticus chapter 4 verses 27 and 31 to 31 this is some um, what uh, we get just a prescription of what should be done if a person sin and if any one of the common people sin through ignorance while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty or if his sin which he hath seen come to his knowledge then he shall bring his offering a kid of the gods, a female without blemish for his sin which he hath sinned. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. 
and the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar and shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offering and the priest shall do what shall burn the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the lord and the priest shall make an atonement for him and shall be forgiven and so this was kind of uh, the daily work that uh, was going on and uh, the sinner had to uh, uh, actually come to the sanctuary uh, as for the plan of redemption. And so the plan of redemption was not finished at the cross. Some say that this plan was finished at the cross. As awesome as was the death of Christ for man, since this didn't complete the redemption story, just as the sacrifice of the lamb in the Hebrew sanctuary didn't complete the plan either. Even though we had the burnt offering for the daily services, the services was not finished when the lamb was offered on the altar of sacrifice. Still, we had the service in the holy place and the services in the most holy place. And the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary did not do away with the services of the holy place and the most holy place. The sanctuary had to be built according to the plan. Christ, as the lamb, as the priest, and the high priest had also to follow the same pattern that he gave to the children of Israel, anti-typically for the sanctuary services to be complete. So people say that the, uh, uh, the plan of redemption was completed at Calvary. Far be it because Calvary only covered a small portion of the sanctuary. And so the sacrifice complete, the priest must now apply the blood. Everything must be done legally and in order. The plan of redemption must be placed on solid and legal footing. And not only that legal full footing, but to fulfill all righteousness. And so by his life and his death, Christ proved that God's justice did not destroy his mercy, but that sin could be forgiven and that the law is righteous and can be perfectly obeyed and gave people another chance to appear before him on the day of atonement in the services of the daily and uh, in the services of the day of atonement. In fact, reading about um, Jesus Christ's death on Calvary and um, what will follow after there, we have um, E.G. White commending on, on this that um, let us um, look uh, at this that um, he had just uh, finished one work to go to another. He had just finished one service to go to another, but um, it was um, not um, completed on uh, I, I, I'll take a look at this later, but um, allow me to To look at this on the great day of atonement let us look at uh, some few things here what she says uh, happened on the day of atonement now i'll start with the uh, i'll start with this quote from great controversy page uh, 420 paragraph one Important truths concerning the atonement are taught by the typical service. A substitute was accepted in the sinner's stead, but the sin was not cancelled by the blood of the victim. A means was thus provided by which it was transferred to the sanctuary. By the offering of blood, the sinner acknowledged the authority of the law, confessed his guilt, transgression, and expressed his desire for pardon through faith in a redeemer to come. But he was not yet entirely released from the condemnation of the law. 
on the day of atonement, the high priest, having taken an offering from the congregation, went into the most holy place with the blood of this offering and sprinkled it upon the mercy seat directly over the law to make satisfaction for it is claim. This is where we find the dual atonement. Then in his character of mediator, he took the sins upon himself and bore them from the sanctuary. Placing his hands upon the head of the scapegoat, he confessed over them, over him all these sins, thus in figure transferring them from himself to the God. The God then bore them away and they were regarded as forever separated from the people. So that was the kind of work that went on. Again, in Great Controversy 480, paragraph 1. In the typical service, only those who had come before God with confession and repentance and whose sins through the blood of the sin offering were transferred to the sanctuary had a part in the service of the Day of Atonement. So in the great day of final atonement and investigative judgment, the only cases considered are those of the professed people of God. The judgment of the wicked is a distinct and separate work and takes place at a later period. Judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel? And talking about judgments starting with uh, the house of God, remember also this is something that is true from the sanctuary standpoint. Before Aaron could make any atonement for the common people, he had to offer his sacrifices first and his famine. And so it was a representative of the judgment starting in the house of God. Then it goes to the common uh, people. Again, this is um, what we read in uh, Great Controversy 483, paragraph 1 and paragraph 2. As the books of record are open in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. Every name is mentioned, every case closely investigated, closely investigated. Names are accepted, names are rejected. When any have sins remaining upon the books of record, unrepented, and of and unforgiven, their names will be blotted out of the book of life and the record of their good deeds will be erased from the book of God's remembrance. The Lord declared to Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Exodus 32-33. And says the prophet Ezekiel, When the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, all his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. Ezekiel 18-24. All who have truly repented of sin and by faith claim the blood of Christ as their atoning sacrifice have had pardon entered against their names in the books of heaven as they have become partakers of the righteousness of Christ and their characters are found to be in harmony with the law of God, their sins will be blotted out and they themselves will be accounted worthy of eternal life. The Lord declares by the prophet Isaiah, I, even I, he that blotted out thy transgression for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Isaiah 43.25 Said Jesus, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I'll not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him I'll confess also before my father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my father, which is in heaven. Revelation 3, 5, Matthew 10, 32 to 33. And uh, 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 another thing uh, is that... Um, uh, when uh, you read uh, the book of Leviticus chapter 16 and Leviticus chapter 23, it is that uh, if a person never appeared before the sanctuary on the day of atonement, he's, he was cut off from Israel. Those who had only gone through the day of atonement and overcame at the one that started the Feast of the Tabernacles or um, that is rejoicing of their sins forgiven and starting anew religious a year and so we are standing uh before uh or we are we, we are in the most solemn days of our lives in this earth history you know sometimes we can gamble with life and say oh 
we know we are in the day of atonement, but we can just do whatever we want. No, we have to look at uh, uh, the days of the typical service, the days of the typical service and see what happened and know what is happening at such a time. The very things which are written in the Old Testament, actually, they are for our learning. For us who have come to the ends of the age of the world. And so we can flatter ourselves that uh, we still have time and nothing is going to happen. But if the Bible is true, we can be sure that what happened in the typical service is going to happen in this antitypical service. Everything the devil had uh, or has ever hoped will be forever uh, 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 destroyed. Everything that he thinks that he will accomplish at the end, everything that the enemy of the souls have taught against God, it shall come to an end. And this is the truth that we can live with or we can deny it, but nonetheless, it will come to happen. And so, uh, what can I say? Again, we can read in Leviticus 16, 29 and 30, we are told, for whatever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. And we can be sure the Lord will do what he has promised that he shall do. The Lord will do uh, what he has promised uh, he will do. When he appears in the clouds of the air, those who have deluded themselves that these are just uh, wishful warnings, they'll find that um, they have forfeited forever their chance to uh, uh, be with Christ forever. It, it better be that we believe now and not regret later than uh, to think that it's a joke right now and then in the end we find ourselves uh, uh, being on the uh, wrong uh, wrong, uh, wrong side of the story. And so I, I want to close. I want to close by saying this. By reading something to us. Two quotes then we close. From the book Christian Service. Christian Service page 90 paragraph 1. I know that the day of atonement is a good news to God's people. Because it is a time. When actually in Daniel chapter 7, we are told that um, God gives us the kingdom and the dominion which is everlasting. He takes away the dominion of the little horn. He takes away the dominion of the evil one and gives the saints the dominion. And so in this day, I want to close with these uh, thoughts. Uh, and uh, I pray that um, this session... Uh, will bless, will be a blessing to our souls. In uh, Christ, Christian service, page uh, 90, paragraph 1, there is no time to sleep now, no time to indulge in useless regrets. He who ventures to slumber now will miss precious opportunities of doing good. We are granted the blessed privilege of gathering sheaves in the great harvest, and every soul saved will be an additional star in the crown of Jesus, our adorable Redeemer who is eager to lay off the armor when by pushing the battle a little longer, he will achieve new victories and gather new trophies for eternity. And so we should be part of that army that uh, is eager to push this battle a little longer and achieve victories and gather new trophies for eternity. We should not be part of those people who are... Uh, 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 drawing back. Lastly, uh, in uh, Christian service page 275, paragraph 1. Be patient, Christian soldier. Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. The night of weary waiting and watching and mourning is nearly over. 
the reward will soon be given the eternal day will be will dawn there is no time to sleep now no time to indulge in useless regret he who ventures to slumber now will miss precious opportunities of doing good and so uh, it now goes again and say we are granted the blessed privilege of gathering sheaves in the great harvest and every soul saved will be an additional star in the crown of Jesus our adorable redeemer who is eager to lay off the armor when by pushing the battle a little longer he will achieve new victories and gather new trophies for eternity we do not need to give up the armor right now but uh, if god willing we need just to push on a little bit longer who knows the time that will come if it is uh, in the night at dawn or in the morning but if the tarring be there let us be found faithful in this day of atonement and may the lord bless us shall we pray Father, again, glory and honor be unto thy name. Thank you for every blessings that you give unto us. We know that um, your work is to lay the glory of man in dust. And Lord, here we are, that you may give us the victory that is essential for such a time as this. And not only us, but we may be channels of others coming into the light. We may be streamlets of the same spirit that we receive from you. And so thank you that uh, this year, Lord, where we have slumbered last year, you shall vivify us and give us, revitalize us, give us new energies to be able to work in thy vineyard. You say, behold, the harvests are ripe, but the reapers are few. O Lord of harvest, we pray that you may bring in more uh, reapers, you may bring in more harvesters, that thy work may not uh, uh, be tarried any longer. Thank you for being patient with us all these days and being faithful when we have also been unfaithful. We pray that uh, we may not continue living this life of praying and sinning and praying and sinning, which is an abomination unto thee. But we pray that uh, our hearts may be knit with the heart of thy son. And at the end, we may be one family, one divine family, to live forever with thee after sin is banished. Not for the motivation of fear of being destroyed, not for the love of selfishness that uh, we want to be Christians, but Lord, for the love of what Christ has done for us. And so give us this agape love and help us to do thy perfect will in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.